Now proteins can be further classified into types. There's two types of proteins. There's fibrous and there's globular proteins. Now fibrous proteins are usually going to be extended and strand-like proteins. And they're frequently active in their secondary conformation. Now remember that secondary conformation could be something as simple as a cubicle structure. Or it could be a beta pleated sheet if you want to think of it. Now these are typically going to be proteins that are going to be linear in nature. They're going to be insoluble in water. They're typically stable in our body and they function to provide tensor strength. Examples of fibrous proteins would include keratin, elastin, collagen, and certain contractile proteins. Frequently we would know these as fibers. And we'd find them in organs such as bone, skin, muscles, hair, and nails. On the flip side, we have globular proteins. Globular proteins are also known as functional proteins. Globular proteins are going to be compact spherical proteins that are going to be active in their tertiary and or quaternary structures. Now what would that look like then? That would look like a structural protein here where it's folded in a secondary conformation and then the tertiary here where we got it folded up and looking like a globular mess. Think of that as being a globular protein. Globular proteins are going to be water soluble, they're going to be mobile, and they're going to be chemically active. Now these are going to be big players in our body in that they're going to include things such as antibodies, hormones, and enzymes. Now when we're thinking about proteins, proteins can be denatured. Now this denaturing can be reversible. Now reversible denaturing means that we've unfolded a protein due to some kind of change in the environment. There's two environmental agents that can cause denaturation of proteins in our body. One is pH and the other is temperature. Now, as you see here in the diagram, imagine if you have this functional protein. And this functional protein is folded up and you can see that it's got its active pocket, the red and the two yellows. Now, notice what happens, though, if you change the pH or if you increase the temperature. It causes those hydrogen bonds to break and it unfolds so it's not active anymore. Now if I only slightly change the pH or slightly change the temperature, then what can happen is, is that I can take the temperature and pH back to normal and it will fold back naturally because the hydrogen bonding interactions that are occurring here occur in nature inside of that water. Now that would be a type of reversal if we have slight change in pH or slight change in temperature. But if we, if for one reason or another, have a drastic change in temperature or drastic change in pH, we can see that the hydrogen bonds would break, but then also those covalent bonds, those peptide bonds between the, the individual amino acids would break as well. If that instance occurs, then we've got a problem because we can take it back to its normal temperature, normal pH, all we want to, but we'll never get the folding that we need because the amino acids will not be lined up anymore. An example of that would be albumin. Albumin is the white of the egg. Now we crack that egg and we look at that albumin. Uh, we look at the white of the egg and about 90% of the, of the protein found within that white of that egg is a protein known as albumin. It's found in its natural functional conformational shape. And we put it in a frying pan and we, we cook it though. And we notice that it goes from that clear state to that white state. That white state happens as you are denaturing the albumin protein. You're causing the hydrogen bonds to break first and foremost. And then you cause the actual peptide bonds to break. Now, no matter how hard you try to take it back to its normal state, back to that normal temperature and normal pH, notice you'll never be able to convert that white of that egg back to that clear state that you got when you cracked the egg. And that's because you irreversibly denatured it. One key globular protein that we want to focus on here is enzymes. Enzymes are biological catalysts, as you know. Enzymes can be active just as a protein itself. But frequently we will find that enzymes are going to be a composite we know as a hollow enzyme. And a hollow enzyme will consist of an APO enzyme, the protein component, and either a cofactor. Now a cofactor can be anything that is a non-protein based molecule. But frequently we think of it as the minerals, copper and iron, or coenzymes. Coenzymes are things such as vitamins. So here you see an example of where we have an enzyme that is going to be built from a protein, but also is going to be controlled, activated by either a cofactor, a mineral, or a coenzyme, which is a vitamin. So here you see why mom wanted you to have your vitamins and minerals. 
Enzymes are chemically specific to only one reaction, and they typically are inactive until they are needed. Typically, they are activated at site. Examples would be at the digestive or in clotting. We'll find that we have enzymes floating around in the blood at all times in their inactive state. They will only form a clot when triggered by a damaged blood vessel. Characteristics of enzymes would include things such as they are frequently named after a reaction in which they catalyze. And all enzymes end in the suffix ASE. The examples being ATPase, lactase, hydrolase, oxidase, synthase, lipase, and more. Now the primary function of enzymes is to lower activation energy. Now enzymes typically work by having a specific active pocket. And that pocket is going to be specific to only one substrate. They will bind to that substrate. They'll hold that substrate in place long enough to allow that reaction to occur. Whether that reaction is to take two amino acids and chemically bond them together, or whether that reaction is to take some large molecule and break it down. Once that reaction has occurred, they'll release the product, and then they'll go and do the same reaction over and over and over again. Now it's time for you to reflect a little bit. Think about the differences between inorganic and organic chemistry. Look at the different types of organic molecules. Look at the carbohydrates. Look at the lipids. And now look at your proteins. Look at the building blocks of proteins, which are amino acids. Look at the different types of amino acids. Then take into consideration what are polypeptides and what are proteins. What are the differences between globular and fibrous proteins? What are enzymes? What is denaturation? What's the difference between reversible and irreversible? You guys have a great day. See you later.